Let's talk about the Moat ETF. It's got $7.2 billion in assets under management. Over the last five years, it's had a compound annual growth rate of 18.5%, and it's got a net expense ratio of 0.47%, or 47 bips. We're going to cover what is a Moat, how does Moat choose their holdings and weight its holdings, how the underlying index has performed, where the returns have came from in this strategy, in other words, what's really driving the returns or what part of the strategy is driving the returns. We're going to take a look at a report that covers the exposure of this ETF and its strategy to academic factors. We're going to take a look at the performance of Moat ETF versus the S&P 500. And then I'll share my final thoughts with you. I'm sure along the way there will be a lot of thoughts, subtopics, and interjections from me. So here we go on the Moat ETF. Okay, so the Moat ETF invests in U.S. companies that Morningstar believes have a moat and are also trading at a low valuation. So naturally, we have to ask, what is a moat? As per Van Eck, who is the fund issuer, economic moat ratings represent the sustainability of a company's competitive advantage. Wide and narrow moat ratings represent Morningstar's belief that a company may maintain its advantage for at least 20 years and at least 10 years, respectively. An economic moat rating of none indicates that a company either has no advantage or an unsustainable one. Quantitative factors used to identify competitive advantages include returns on invested capital relative to cost of capital, while qualitative factors used to identify competitive advantage include customer switching cost, cost advantages, intangible assets, network effects, and efficient scale. And they've got this cool little chart right here that shows, you know, exactly kind of, or tries to show, not exactly, but tries to show what they mean by it in the layers and why narrow and none, right? So uh, you can take a look at this report here. Let me see if I can find it right here, which shows further details of Morningstar's five sources of moat and breaks them all down and gives some examples. So for example, Switching costs build moats and retain customers. Stryker Corp is a top tier competitor in a number of medical markets. These include orthopedic implants, surgical equipment, endoscopy, and neurovascular devices. Since switching costs can be significant for surgeons, when it comes to orthopedic implants, this is, according to Morningstar, one of Stryker's modious divisions in support of the company's wide economic moat. And then it's got another example of Salesforce, and then it's got prior examples uh, from companies that were included in the index. So the moat thing, it seems like, is something that's kind of internally driven by analysts. Going further into it, valuation is a very important factor of moat, right? So not only do they seek to invest in companies that have a moat, but they want to invest in companies that are at a low valuation and have a moat as well. So we can see this report here from December 17th, which is a constituent update. It shows the index constituents that were added. In the ones that were removed, we can see this price to fair value column. Now, fair value, I did some research to see what actually you know, comprises of fair value or how they come up with that number. And there's very, very little information out there. It's just an internal analyst number that they come up with in some way, but they're not actually publicizing much about how they come up with fair value. So taking a look at this list, I was surprised to see Salesforce on here. Because I know Salesforce has a high price to earnings ratio, so I looked it up for December 17th. And as of December 17th, that price to earnings ratio is about, or not about, it was exactly 139.74. That was incredibly high, so I was surprised to see that on there. That's much higher than S&P 500's price to earnings ratio. But apparently, somebody at Morningstar <laughs> thinks that Salesforce is a value, you know, is trading below what its valuation should be. So I looked up what the price to earnings ratio was for the whole ETF, and we can see right here the price to earnings ratio for the whole fund is 18.18, which is lower than the category average of 20.67, and that's a large blend category average, so that's about the S&P 500. Now, how do they weight the actual holdings? Well, that's very simple. We can come back to this document right here, and we can see the weight is simply equal weighted, 2.5%, 2.5% times 40. They simply just take the holdings, the one that meet the criteria, and weight them at 2.5% and essentially have an equal weighted index. This in and of itself does give it a bit of a small tilt, right? Because it's not market cap weighting, which is going to lend itself to the big companies. 
Instead, by equal weighting them, it's giving the small companies just as much exposure as the large companies. So how has the index performed? Well, the Morningstar Wide Moat Focus Index has delivered more than 300 basis points of annual excess returns versus the broader US equity market since its inception in early 2007. That would be February 2007, and this data is based on going through Q2 or June 30th of 2020. So it's outperformed by more than three percentage points annually. But that's just the underlying index. There's something we have to consider, and that is, number one, the ETF itself has not been around since February 2007. I don't think the ETF itself uh, was launched till 2012. And then with that, that's just the index. That doesn't you know, represent how things have actually performed uh, in live trading, so to say, even though there's really not much trading going on. Right? There's going to be differences. There's going to be slippage between how the ETF itself has performed and how the underlying index has performed. If we pull up this chart right here, uh, we can see that $10,000 investment going back to February 2007, the start of the index, mind you again, the, live, the ETF did not start trading until 2012. Uh, $10,000 investment here would have grown to 43,270, I think that's what that number is. Versus the Morningstar's US market index would have just returned you know, much less, 28,517. So by those metrics, it's performing quite well. And then we also have the risk adjusted return, which it shows the sharp ratio in this report as well. And if we find that, we can see the annualized sharp ratio here is higher, 0.78 versus the Morningstar US market index of 0.53. So its risk adjusted return is higher. And you know we can see that here because it, well, it doesn't draw down as much during 2009. And there are also some periods here, which like I think 2015, where it is less volatile in a sideways market, which 2015 was. So we know that the moat ETF is comprised of returns between stock selection of stocks with moats, and then also the valuation. And then you could also say the size tilt or the weighting. Well, interestingly enough, I found this chart in a report from Morningstar here, or Van Ack, excuse me, Van Ack or Morningstar, <laughs> Morningstar it is, uh, and it shows where they're finding excess returns, right? And we can look at this here, it shows the Morningstar US market index returning 8.2% annually from February 20, uh, 2007 to June 30th, 2020, right? And then it's showing where the excess returns are coming from. And it's showing that the economic moat screen adds 1.1% annually to things, right? And then, the equal weighting behind it, so this is essentially giving it a small cap tilt, adds 1.3% of returns. And then finally, once you factor in the valuation screen behind it, in their valuation factor, that adds another 1%. So they're saying that these three things and these little increases that each level of screen, or maybe not level of screen, but the tilt, uh, when we're talking about equal weighting adds, is what's accounting for this roughly 3% in outperformance over this total period of time. Then there's also this report from Morningstar I found, which was pretty cool. Morningstar Wide Moat Focus Index Through a Factor Lens, which basically examines how the exposures to factors have driven the returns in here. And we can see on this chart where the Wide Moat Focus ETF, or, or fund, or excuse me, index, running through all the names there, where the Wide Moat Focus Index was as of the date of this, April 2021, so this is pretty recent, uh, where the historical range is, and then again, where the Morningstar's US market total return is. So we can see just kind of how, on a factor basis, how deviated it is from the actual broad market US market cap weighted index. And if we scroll on down in here, uh, we can see that the active contribution is largely driven by size and liquidity factors. Now, what I thought was interesting is that it doesn't have much exposure to quality. And you know, one of the reasons behind this, and I think this is mentioned somewhere in this report or in another report I found, is that what they say is that the quality factor is hindsight looking. It's looking at companies that have historically been quality, whereas the moat strategy is looking at 
future activity and which companies are going to have a moat in the future. So therefore, you know, or that explains why it doesn't have much exposure to the quality factor. Of course, we could not talk about any US equity ETF without comparing it to the S&P 500. So I went ahead and put this ETF on a total return chart with the S&P 500. And we can see that $10,000 invested on April 30th, 2012 would have grown to 41,674 compared with an S&P 500 of $40,201. So it has outperformed the S&P 500 over its roughly what is a seven and a half year period. I hope I'm doing the quick math on those years correctly. But over this period, it has outperformed the S&P 500 by a little bit. But now you might be saying, well, what about that three percentage annually that it has outperformed the US total market that we talked about earlier? Well, that's a very good point, right? So there's two things to consider here. Number one, that was based on data uh, going back to the index's conception date or in inception date. I'm not sure exactly what the right term is, but the index, was created back in 2007, whereas the fund itself was launched in 2012. And then you also have to factor in the actual kind of slippage that's associated with live trading or running this strategy live. That's not accounted for in these index charts that you see right here. So over this period of time, it had outperformed by 3% annually, but the, act or the index, I should say, had outperformed by 3% annually but since going live, the ETF is not outperformed by that much. It's outperformed a little bit, but not by that much. So yeah, I mean, we can clearly see that uh, maybe the timeline was cherry picked here. We can see that during 08, 09, the strategy of moat did not draw down as much as the, uh, as the S&P 500, which certainly, um, certainly kind of gives it a leg up over the S&P 500 in terms of total return. Now, there's also an international moat fund that invests in international stocks. That's MOTI. So let's see if we can pull this up here. Where is it? Those are equities, where's ETF? There's, there's MOTI. We can see it down here. Now, of course, on a chart with the S&P 500, anything international is not gonna, not gonna look great at all. So let's just put EFA on there. I'm going to put EFA on there and let's go up there. Yeah. All right. So the strategy was live. Now we can see that um, MOTI, the MOTI ETF, the International MOTI ETF has outperformed by a pretty good bit over EFA, but you know, that outperformance is just recent, right? For a while, it was kind of underperforming the EFA index. It wasn't until this year, I mean, pretty recently this year, six months ago, that it actually started outperforming. So uh, there, I mean, there really hasn't been a, you know, timeline rolling one year period of outperformance for the MOTI ETF as well. One thing we should also take a look at and consider though, is how Moat ETF has performed to a value index because valuation is a major part of the methodology behind comprising its holdings. So let's just put Vanguard's value, large value index on here and see how it's done. And holy smokes, I mean, we can see value totally getting its ass kicked over the last seven and a half years and basically over the last 10 to 12 years, value has totally got its ass kicked. But considering that valuation is a significant factor in the methodology here, you know, relative to a value-based index, we can see Moat ETF is actually doing pretty well. Over the last 10 years, it has basically been impossible uh, for anything to beat market cap weighting, right? If you look at all of the factors out there and consider market cap as a methodology and basically a factor, market cap has outperformed basically everything else. So to beat market cap weighting has been incredibly difficult. And I think when we compare more of an apples to apples basis here, I would say that valuation or value, a value index is more of an apples to apples comparison than a broad um, a broad market cap weighted index, we can see that Moat has done well and absolutely kicked ass. So what are my final thoughts on the Moat ETF? Well, first of all, I like that the fund issuer Van Eck publishes a lot of research and documentation on the index and also the fund itself. You can go to vanack.com, go to the Moat ETF page, and then click on documents and find most of the uh, documentation and information that I covered here in this video. Nice, convenient. 
And then the fund itself, I really like this, the fund itself has a very narrow portfolio of holdings. There's only 40 holdings in it, roughly. And it, it might go up or down at, you know, at certain times, but roughly speaking, 40 holdings. Um, you know, that's in stark contrast to a lot of large cap equity funds that hold just basically the S&P 500 with a slight twist. Like I did a video a couple days ago about ESGU, which is BlackRock Social Responsibility Fund. If you look at the top 10 holdings, it is basically the same as the S&P 500, right? And the weightings are damn near the same as well. It is literally just S&P 500 in drag. That's what I called it. Uh, and it charges 5X on the fees compared to BlackRock's S&P 500 index tracker. So BlackRock is certainly loving it for the fees and the revenue that this little twist on so so social responsibility brings in. Moat ETF here is not like that. It, you know, it holds a relatively concentrated and convicted portfolio of just 40 holdings. And then, you know, there's the exposure that it gets you to the market. Now, you know, here it hasn't really outperformed S&P 500 by a long shot, but I think that this ETF moat in its value component could represent in your portfolio the value component of your portfolio uh, instead of just a broad value index tracker. So those are my thoughts on the Moat ETF. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below.